Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Salvador Forquilla. I am a, a researcher at the Institute for Social and Economic Studies based in Maputo, Mozambique. So first of all, I would like to say many thanks to the organizers of the conference for the invitation. And uh, uh, thanks also to the speakers, the four speakers, uh, for their valuable insights on the topic of this panel. Um, I've structured my intervention in two moments. I will start by giving a, a very brief and general um, comments on the four presentations we had this afternoon. And I will then move to the second moment um, by bringing some insights uh, to the topic of this panel, particularly the links between armed groups and local populations based on the work we have been developing uh, on armed conflict in northern Mozambique. Uh, the four presentations uh, we had provide a very interesting analytical framework uh, to understand the dynamics of the armed groups in terms of uh, territorial control, uh, their persistence over time, um, but also the dynamics of DDR programs uh, the way um, uh, armed groups use violence at the early stage of their existence uh, and intercommunal uh, violence. So um, there is a kind of difficult, and, and it's clear in the presentation of Janet, uh, the difficult of making distinction between the types of new formed armed groups, political or criminal, uh, is in many ways challenging, not only for states, uh, but also for researchers. Perhaps this is uh, um, the reason why most of the armed groups at the early stage are seen as criminals without any agenda, and therefore simply bandits, criminals. And this was the case, uh, for, for example, of some liberation movements uh, and rebel groups in Africa. Uh, including Mozambique, uh, if we think of Limo, Rinamo, or, or the, the, the armed groups that we have in northern Mozambique, it's the same. At the, at the beginning, they are called criminals, bandits, etc., etc. So, um, as a result, many states uh, seem to underestimate the real nature and implications of newly formed armed groups, and some of them manage to develop into well-structured groups with a social basis. And this takes me to the second moment of my intervention, so the discussion on the links between armed groups and local populations, asking the following questions. Why and how armed groups manage to advance on the ground and build a narrative that mobilizes certain groups in a society? Which factors are likely to help uh, armed groups to spread territorially? So in order to address these questions, it's important to take into account two main aspects that come from the literature and have high importance uh, from policy point of view. The first aspect has to do with people who join or support armed groups. Those people whose poverty, misery, frustration, and fragility are exploited by armed groups are not necessarily criminals at the moment they join in. They are ordinary people, very often living at the margin of the state with the feeling of social, political, and economic exclusion and no basic service at all. These people live at the margin of the state as a result of the type of political institutions that have been put in place and the way these institutions function, which produces and reproduces marginalities as very often they don't, have, they don't get any service from the state, no education services, no health services, no water and sanitation service, for example, so the state becomes literally meaningless in their everyday life. Therefore, the development of some armed groups and the way they evolve on the ground, to some extent, has a lot to do with the state building process and dynamics. Taking the example of current armed violence in northern Mozambique, evidence on the ground suggests that the insurgents, as it's 
at, at its early stage, seems to have developed in areas and among population groups marginalized by the state, mobilizing in particular young people in rupture with the state, but also in rupture with the traditional society insofar as they adopt the fundamentalist practice of Islam. The literature on civil war in Mozambique shows how Renamo, the former rebel movement, mobilized local cleavages in its favor. In this regard, it seems that in northern Mozambique at early stage, uh, uh, Mozambique was facing same kind of dynamics which characterized the civil war in the 80s, uh, which means the arrival of an armed group bringing a discourse of opposition to established order acts to accelerate social discontent and the radicalizes socio-political cleavages, some of them historical, which already existed locally. And this allowed Al-Shabaab, uh, this uh, armed group uh, uh, operating now in northern Mozambique, uh, so this uh, uh, allowed Al-Shabaab to find a certain support from more marginalized, marginalized sectors, particularly young people who, in some cases, sold what little they had and went to join. Uh, 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 the group. And thanks to this support, Al-Shabaab was able to set up an efficient network of logistical and information gathering uh, formed by young people divided into small groups inserted into the communities. In addition to uh, logistical support, these youth undertook surveillance and keep the insurgents informed about the movement, for example, of the uh, defense, defense forces in the area. Uh, uh, a fact which played an important role in launching, launching Al-Shabaab military operations. Therefore, just as happened with the RINAMU, the former rebel movement in Mozambique during the civil war in the 80s, in northern Mozambique, Al-Shabaab has managed to some extent to penetrate into the social fabric of the local communities, which has allowed the group greater mobility on the ground and efficiency uh, in military operations. The second aspect that, I need, uh, that needs to be taken into account in the context of questions related to the links between armed groups and local populations has to do with internal conflicts in a society. In order for the armed groups to develop and engage in a large scale, scale violence, they mobilize internal conflicts that exist already. In many cases, these internal conflicts are social, political, economic, so, uh, religious, ethnic, link it to the process and dynamics of state building uh, in post-era, uh, particular in Africa. These aspects I have mentioned take me to two important issues related to armed groups. The first one is recruitment. In this regard, I would like to ask at least three questions. Why social segments are primarily targeted by uh, armed groups for recruitment purposes? Uh, why are these social segments targeted? How are they recruited? And which segments, uh, uh, segments are we, so, 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 sorry, which social segments are we talking about? And the second important issue has to do with the reintegration of the former fighters. Uh, the so-called DDR programs. And the question here is, to, is how to build meaningful DDR programs based on the root causes of the conflict and the nature and dynamics of the armed groups. How to maximize research findings in order to, context, to have contextualized and meaningful DDR programs. So let's start with recruitment. Uh, the growing literature on extremist, extremist armed groups of a jihad nature agrees in considering that the recruitment process is not uniform as there are differences in the way different jihadist groups recruit. For example, Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab from Somalia, um, um, they have different recruitment strategies and reflecting very often the political configuration of the countries where they operate. In the case of the insurgents in northern Mozambique, for example, evidence from research shows that the advance of the insurgents made use of the dynamics of external and internal migration. This created a vast network of recruitment for Al-Shabaab, 
which has been facilitated essentially by porous borders with Tanzania and by fishing activity on the islands of Cap Delgado coast. In this regard, the border dynamics between Mozambique and Tanzania and the internal migration of young fishermen from Nampula coastal area to uh, Cap Delgado uh, have expanded the recruitment network of the Al Shabaab, allowing it to increase its ranks and consolidate its actions on the ground. Therefore, uh, in its early stage, Al Shabaab has managed to use of local, to make use of local social economic, political, and religious dynamics for recruitment purpose, focusing on various aspects such as local religious division within Islam, ethnic divisions, mobilization of anti-state or anti frelimo narrative, microcredit micro schemes to boost small business for future recruits, promises of employment in the uh, Cap Delgado fishing sector, or in mining uh, and other activities um, for example, in uh, Nyasa and, uh, and the other locations. So finally, to conclude, uh, with regard to reintegration of the former fighters, uh, I think it's crucial to have a solid knowledge, not only of the root cause of the conflict to be addressed, but also a solid knowledge of the contextual dynamics of the armed groups whose fighters need to be disarmed, demobilized, and reintegrated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salvador. And uh, we have now a little bit more than, we have around 17 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, and I would like to start in the room and then somebody helps me uh, go on, open online. Uh, I guess we use the microphone, please, here, and then Gentleman in the back, yeah, please. Thank you very much, I'll try to be very brief. Uh, my name is Olero I have two hats. I'm a senior fellow at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and I'm also a senior advisor at the Peace Center Foreign Affairs. Uh, first uh, question to uh, Austin. Uh, I used to serve in Afghanistan myself and there was a lot of uh, debate about the control the Taliban had throughout the years, and it was a hot topic, obviously. Uh, you didn't talk about influence, because as we know, the, the point is that in the case of Afghanistan, uh, the, the Taliban controlled very little, actually, the heartlands, and then the government, the cities and the district centers. But the Taliban controlled, I mean, sorry, had uh, exerted a lot of influence uh, over the territory, and it grew throughout the years. So maybe if you can talk about a bit about, you know, the vast uh, fluid gray zone about influence. Thanks. Uh, then the second uh, point to Tarila. Uh, fantastic paper also. Uh, fascinating case study. Um, just one question. What were the conditions allowing or pushing the Nigerian state uh, to engage with the armed groups and begin the DDR process? Because I, I think that's, that probably was very crucial and may, may apply to other settings. So. That would be interesting. Uh, thirdly, to Janet, uh, how conflicts start, also a fascinating uh, topic indeed. Uh, you did not say anything about the role of conflict entrepreneurs, because we know, for example, in the case of Mali, uh, Jamaat and Nusratul Islam, uh, Muslim in Jainim, the Al Qaeda affiliated uh, group, uh, carried a lot of uh, activities in Mali, and, and they sort of played between the conflict of the pastoralists and uh, agriculturalists. So, I mean, where, where do these conflict uh, entrepreneurs uh, figure in your uh, research? Because, I mean, that's, that's, you know, these guys usually are the ones that stir, stir up trouble. And, and the question is that if you don't have conflict entrepreneurs entering the stage, would, would the conflict uh, basically peter out? I mean, just, uh, they would not, uh, you know, flash. That's the question. And finally, to Daniel, also a fascinating topic. Can you, uh, open a bit the, um, the your final slide on the sort of interplay and the continuum between the local and the national level stuff. I mean, it sounded very uh, interesting that you what you talked about, but uh, I didn't quite get the, um, the, the gist of that. So if you can open up a bit, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's take a few more questions and then I'll give the floor. So, so remember this, there was the gentleman in the back.
the second presenter on the on the paper titled "Rethinking Intercommunal Violence in Africa." <clears throat> uh, I would like to correct uh, some uh, impression by the presenter that uh, in Nigeria the state uh, see uh, rural violence as a uh, uh, relationship between the communal bandit and the vigilante. Uh, here, uh, I would like to say that uh, conflict in the Northwest is dynamics and it can be traced across different contours, which feed into one. Uh, it's dynamic in the sense that if you go to certain part of the Northwest, which he has used as his case study, Kaduna in particular, the conflict there is about ethnic issues, which is communal. When you move out of Kaduna State, which within the same region, and you go to another state, which is Samfara, Samfara State, the conflict there is not about ethnic. It was about crisis of interest. And it was from the crisis of interest, it degenerated into ethnic issue between the Fulanis, or which we call the others and the farmers. And from there, it now turned into what we have a, a rural bandit, bandit or armed bandit now that turned into kidnapping and some other issue that has to do with conflict. So it was not issue, the, the, the vigilante were part of community resilience used by the community when they notice that the government is weak and can, is not, the government is not capable, the state is not capable to face the bandit. So the vigilantes has to come in as a community police to save the community member from the attacks of the bandits. So it was then when it now turned into bandit and the vigilante. Then uh, my second uh, comment will goes to the last presenter uh, when he, he is talking about recruitment and how does the armed group uh, increase their, 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 their harmings. Uh, you, I would like you to go deep into some of the strategy used to recruit. There are some people, for example, he made mention of Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria. There are some people who are actors, who are members of Boko Haram, but they do not join the group, not because of vulnerability in terms of livelihood, but because they do not have option. They need protection, and the state cannot provide the necessary protection. So they have no option than to join the Boko Haram, and uh, they now serve as informants living within the society, but they are now informant to the Boko Haram. So there are some people that join bandits or rebel group, not because out of their own wish, or because they, but they look at the, the state has failed to protect them, and they need protection. And therefore, they believe that their protection can only come from the bandit. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more question from this side. Yes, the lady there by the wall. Can everyone hear me? Thank you so much for really interesting panels. Um, I'll just pick out one or two things, but uh, so much to talk about. Janet, I'm, I'm really excited about your work in this space, and I absolutely agree with you, having spent a lot of time in the GTD. Um, I think there's also the issue of not just the data sets themselves and how they're created, but also how they're used. Frequently, researchers cut out groups that only have a certain number of attacks as being serious bona fide groups, but it distorts this problem that you're talking about even more significantly. I wondered if you could maybe give us a little bit more on sort of capacity versus interest of these emerging groups um, and what we can tell from what we can see or not see in them, because that's always really quite difficult. And I also wondered if you'd considered sort of two other hypotheses that come out of the sort of criminology literature and some of the literature more on sort of uh, small underground terrorist groups, but for the sort of gang literature on sort of social processes in groups and the value of external violence, both for team building, um, training, et cetera. So that might be of interest. And then also for small underground terrorist groups when they're trying to determine if they actually could transition to something larger, like a social movement, and they're trying to see if they have larger support outside in the community, and attacks sometimes allow them to see if, if the community responds in different ways. So I wondered if those had any resonance for you or were considered. And then Trela, I would love to hear more about uh, how you would envision 
particularly given you know, DDR has, has transitioned pretty significantly in how we think about breaking social bonds between commanders uh, and the people that, that operated underneath them, but how you see those relationships potentially being transformable into something positive, um, both politically and economically for societies, and so we can program more effectively. So I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, on that particular topic. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent questions. I will now ask uh, our speakers uh, and discussant to answer answer all the questions that, you, that, that were directed to you and try to be as brief as possible so that we can have another round and then you can continue the discussions over coffee. But yes, Dan, please. Okay, thank you. Is this on? Oh. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'll take the first question first. Um, so, it, okay, the, it's not the visuals not on the the slides anymore, but what um, that's kind of getting at is having three different types of conflict. So, kind of revenge attacks, which is the most distant from from the kind of state state and military elites. Then a kind of intermediate kind of category where you might have kind of local power struggles between, say, a governor or, or officials of that type of level, um, and then finally. Um, kind of elite proxy wars where uh, th those very close to at the heart of state power or attached to it in some kind of way uh, use different militias to help settle their scores. And so one of the things that I want to kind of emphasize with that is the, the visual that I showed there, that would be how I would characterize the situation in 2021, but it would look different now. Okay, so the, the groups would have moved into different places. Some the, some conflicts would have disappeared. Others, new ones have, have, have appeared in, in in parts of Unity and Upper Nile State. And likewise, in, if we were to roll the time back to 2020, it would look different still. But what I think would happen is you would see, in the main, group militia groups forming as a result of kind of elite contests, then drifting away and then being kind of ensnared or recaptured back in. Uh, and to, thank you uh, for the, uh, the 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 gentleman talking about uh, Kaduna and Zamfara. Uh, yeah, I, d I, d I very much agree, especially your characterization of a crisis of interests. I think that's that that's very much on point. I, I'd say that's quite compatible with what I was arguing, uh, and I think the the kind of the, the way in which groups can kind of change, um, can move from one uh, one form to another. And are often that that trajectory is mediated by a set of interests. I think is is one of the things I'm hoping to kind of capture with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And then over to Tarila. Thank you. Thank you very much for for both questions. Um, first, what were the conditions pushing the Nigerian states to engage the armed groups? Uh, and I return to the to the argument. Actually, it's the the, the logic of power at the time of the conflict. So, in 2009. Armed groups, especially the leaders, have become quite powerful in relation to oil production, but also in the rural politics of the country. And armed groups, uh, political leaders, uh, leaders of armed groups were able to influence electoral outcomes in communities. And Nigerian elites recognize that if this is allowed to continue, that they will be completely displaced by these armed groups from that region. Recognizing that, and also in relation to oil, the elite consensus was to reach out to these armed groups and to recruit them, actually, to, to, to mobilize them into some kind of form of political agreement that allows them to benefit from, from, from the political process and also the oil industry. And the outcome of such an agreement or, or such a process is one that reinforces this logic of power that sustains the conflict in other ways. Um, I hope that responds to the question. And the second point, question on how to envision the transformation of the relations between leaders and followers, like armed group leaders and ordinary fighters. This is actually, the, for me, in my research and also reflecting on DDR globally, is probably the most difficult part of DDR programs. It's not necessarily, people always question or say, reintegration programs fail. Indeed, that is quite obvious. The question is that why do we have the link between, why, well, how do we explain the mobilization outcomes? We, are, we know a lot about reintegration outcomes, but we do not know so much about the mobilization, which is to the link these fighters from their leaders. So what we see is that due to the political economy, 
of peace itself, one in which that places the armed group leaders at the center of the mobilization that we sustain these networks. So if you will ask me that from my own experience, how do we design better programs, I will, I will say that uh, you need to refer back to what our colleague here has mentioned about the categorization of conflict uh, and the groups. So which individuals are, are much more tied to their leaders? Which, who, who are victims of conflict? Who, who, which uh, armed, members of armed groups, some are victims which were forcefully recruited, those were, that were forcefully recruited, those that joined as a result of hunger. So we, in, in summary actually, just for the sake of time, is that we need to better understand recruitment in design to enable us design effective demobilization programs. Thank you. Moving over to Salvador. And uh, yes, be respectful of time. Yeah, Thank please. You very much. Uh, comment on the strategies of recruitment. And, uh, and I fully agree with the comment. And uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, during my presentation, the strategies of recruitment uh, depend very much on the local context and uh, and, uh, uh, and dynamics. So the most excluded uh, social, economic, and, and political groups, uh, they are the most uh, uh, important targets of recruitment. And uh, this is the case uh, in, in, in many armed groups. Uh, if you look at uh, Boko Haram, uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, even uh, Al-Shabaab in Northern Mozambique. So uh, uh, of course, uh, some people join in uh, because they are forced to join in. Uh, others, they join in um, because they don't have a uh, choice because, and they see uh, these armed groups as altern an alternative, as an opportunity. And others, uh, they join in because they want to join in, uh, especially at the early stage of the uh, armed groups. Thank you. Thank you. Then uh, Janet and Austin, two minute, minutes each for you. <laughs> Please, Janet. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your questions, and I'll, I'll be brief. But uh, please do follow up by, by email, or I'm happy to follow up chat on, on Zoom. Um, so, uh, great questions about conflict entrepreneurs and capacity uh, versus interest. And I'll just say, I think I, I agree with the spirit of both of uh, where these questions are coming from. And and what I presented today is is part of a broader theory of rebel group formation in, in the book. And I agree with the first questioner's characterization of um, like so, so communities the world over have a broad range of uh, social cleavages and I, I do think that these dynamics of rebel group formation tend to be sparked they tend to start when there is a one or a few conflict entrepreneurs that come together and do make a decision to violently challenge the state right and we don't get to observe what their ultimate goals are in these early phases right but I do believe that you know they're the sort of a range of what their goals or ends in mind they, they have as they get started. And some of them, you know, we may think are normatively justified and, and others not. Um, and, but, the, but the point here is that for outside observers, it's just very hard to understand what's going on and to distinguish um, whether they have political aims or, or sort of criminal or economic ones. And, um, and so I do uh, agree that this, this starts when these conflict entrepreneurs Try, try things out. And, and in the book, I didn't highlight in the presentation, but um, I do have a theory where the dynamics uh, between rebels and civilians is very important. This echoes a lot of what Salvador was actually saying in his comments, um, and that rebels are very interested in um, using violence in a way that crafts uh, narratives that are propagated through the community about who they are, what they want, and how confident that they'll be. And that's important for their survival in these nascent stages. Um, and it's it's an important piece of how they're using violence in this small way to test out, you know, not only their operational environment in terms of the, the capacity of the state, but also how the community respond to them, how uh, the extent to which the narratives that they're sort of propagating through their rumor networks may or may not resonate with the state, um, or excuse me, with the civilians, local community in ways that might mobilize uh, the community on their behalf or may um, cause them to to reject them. So I do think it's more of a, an interest uh, issue when, in, in terms of how they're, they're using violence. So I'll leave it there, but look forward to continuing the conversation, perhaps uh, by email or by Zoom. Austin, over to you. 
Sure. So, uh, yeah, no, this isn't, this is an excellent comment. Um, you know, Afghanistan is a case where uh, there is a key differentiation between zones of influence and zones of control. Um, and I think that that is also, you know, theoretically relevant in, in a number of other cases. So what the, what this measure picks up, you know, if you were to, to go back to the slides and look at the time series, it's actually pretty flat up until the, the sort of the um, final drawdown in, in for, at the end of 14, the biggest drawdown at the end of 14. And then sort of the, the physical territorial control begins to take off. But I do think that there, is a, there are ways to think about measuring influence, which are separate from territorial control, uh, one of which is uh, curfews. Um, especially in the use of, of the cell network. And so we have this information as well, and we're planning on incorporating that. So thank you. It's great points. Much. Uh, it's clear that this is a topic that really merits a conference of its own. I noticed there were many, many questions that were, there was no time to have them now, but please continue, seek each other up and continue over the coffee break. Thank you very much.